Welcome to the Jay Martin Show. If you're new here, my name is Jay. I'm an investor. I'm here looking for the smartest home for my cash. So if that sounds like you, I think you're gonna like what we do here as well. Now, my guest today is Mark Moss, good buddy who's been on the show many times. And today we cover a ton of ground in this hour long conversation, some of which is relatively fringe. And what Mark says may make you cock an eyebrow. But what I'll say about Mark is that whatever he brings forward, his concepts, his ideas, his his theses about how he's interpreting the world, is always supported by hours of hard work and research. And so I really enjoy learning from Mark. Before we jump in here, I have a special announcement in response to the hundreds of requests that I've gotten from newsletter subscribers, YouTube viewers, and conference attendees over the last 18 months asking, how can I get started building a portfolio in the commodities sector? We have built the Commodity University. This is a 10 chapter video course going through the very fundamental concepts of commodity supply and demand dynamics, deep dives into a select few hard commodities all the way through to portfolio construction. Check it out at thecommodityuniversity.com. I'm super pumped about this and I know you're going to love it. Here is Mark Moss. Enjoy. This is Jay Martin. All right, here I am with Mark Moss. Mark, it's great to have you back on the show and good to see you, man. Yeah, Jay. Uh, I, I love coming back and talking to you. It's a pleasure. Uh, I love hanging out. So I'm, I'm excited for today. Let's jump into it. So there's a handful of concepts I want to run through. Let's start with like some near term, you know, economic thoughts, because, you know, you're probably hearing the same conversations I'm hearing, like hard landing, soft landing, recession, no recession. Did it pass us all this stuff? You know, what's your take right now, Mark? Think like near term, six, 12 months. What are you watching? Yeah. yeah. So um, first of all, uh, that's a that, that's great that you framed it up with the time frame. That's one thing I always want. I want to clarify with everybody that's listening is whenever you hear someone talking, like let's try to understand what time frame they're talking about. Um, I would also say as an investor, uh, you shouldn't be thinking short term. If you're thinking in time in terms of weeks and months, like you're never gonna make it. Um, so I typically don't really focus on super short term that much to me anyway. Uh, but anyway, back to back to the question. Um, you know, man. We're we're in some pretty shaky times right now. Obviously, bond the bond market's like uh, getting pretty crazy, but we're seeing like um, super conflicting um, signals everywhere we look, right? And so I think that's one of the big things that I've been focusing on. Where it's like the stocks have been holding up pretty well; they're bouncing off of support right now. It looks pretty good. The bond markets show massive problems. Um, the real estate market's holding up really, really well, but yet. Um, but yet the, you know, the, the interest rates and the home prices are now more unaffordable than they've ever been. Um, we have, uh, the, 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 you know, interest rates super high, the corporate bond market should be blowing up, but yet corporations are still turning in record profits. And so like, we have this like paradox with like everything. And so it's really hard to tell what's going on. I think, um, you know, in terms of, of the recession, a couple of things I'd say in regards to that, like, uh, we can see certainly consumer um, savings is dwindling at a record rate while consumer credit is going through the roof. So it looks like consumers are getting pretty tapped out. So I think that looks pretty bad. However, savings and just actually consumer net worth is actually still at a pretty record high. Uh, so like we have lots of trouble on the horizon, but yet things are still holding up pretty good. Um, so it, You know, it's hard to tell what's going on. I think, to in my opinion, what's happening is, um, you know, markets always want to sort of revert to their mean. So nothing moves up or down in a straight line. The further it gets away from its mean to the upside or downside, the further it moves on the downside mover or the opposite, right? And so what happened is, if you look at a trend line, I was looking at a series of charts yesterday. I don't have them pulled up right now, uh, but it was looking at everything from employment to GDP to consumer spending. we have this like pretty good arc. And then in this 2020 anomaly that we had where, you know, in the U S between fed and and fiscal monetary and fiscal intervention, we had almost $10 trillion dumped into the market. You know Um, it pushed everything way up out of whack. And now it's all coming back down to the trend line. And so we're decelerating. So it's super important to look at charts. When I do my videos on my main YouTube channel, I always like to show charts because I think it's important to see the size and the speed of the moves. But if you if you zoom out, like we're 
were decelerating. You saw um, headlines everywhere. Oil's crashing. Oil's crashing. Well, it, it wasn't crashing. It just had gone from, you know, 80, 90 bucks to 150 because of the, you know, threat of the war and, and Russia not having oil in the market anymore. So it went super high and it just came back down to 90. So it crashed from 150 to 90, but that that move from 90 to 150 was like this anomaly, right? So I think a lot of what we're seeing is this massive deceleration that's just bringing us back to normal growth. Um, so I think I think a lot of it is overblown. But what happens is because we went so far to the upside, unfortunately, I think we're going to probably correct to the downside of that um, of that mean, right? So as far as back to the question of the recession, um, a couple of indicators that I'm certainly watching are um, certainly the yield curve, right? So like all eyes are on the yield curve for sure. I think um, I'm also looking at, you know, everyone talks about um, the Fed going on this war path of raising rates at the fastest rate in history. And it typically has a lag. So there's like a lag effect to see those changes come in. Um, typically they say those come in somewhere between 12 to 18 months afterwards. Uh, but the problem is that we've got, sometimes the Fed raises rates very slow. Sometimes they raise them very fast. So we kind of have this, this range. And so if we're looking at a recession, when is it coming? Sort of what I'm looking at are both the timing from the Fed funds rates change, but also from the yield curve control. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the the yield curve inversion, I should say. <laughs> we'll come back to the yield curve control in a minute. But so uh, it's it, in terms of recessions, I've been mapping it out from the start of the Fed funds going up and from the potential pause where we're at right now. Um, and I've also looked at the the yield curve inversion. And, you know, my best guess is, yeah, we probably do hit a recession, uh, which would be, you know, typically uh, the Biden administration changed the definite of recession earlier this year, uh, but could be, you know, somewhere between um, early next year to, you know, sometime probably my guess is Q2, Q3 of next year, uh, we'll hit some sort of a recession. Um, okay. But what does that even mean? And so this is the next piece. Uh, let me just let me just phrase. I'm a little bit of a contrarian right now. Um, I'm an inflation bull, and I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm an optimist. Optimist. <laughs> um, and what do I mean by that? Um, so what does a recession even mean? So we saw in 2020 that a recession typically would be measured by the economy slowing down, the economy having two quarters of negative growth would be a recession. But we saw in 2020 that even when the entire economy was shut down, literally businesses were put out of business, markets still made new all-time highs. So are we talking about markets or are we talking about economies, first of all? And second of all, what does the recession mean to you or me? Well, if yeah. you're in home building, the recession probably hits you a lot more than if you're selling consumer staples, for example. If you're a doctor, you're not even going to notice the recession. Right. So uh, I think it means different things to different people. My guess is, though, we probably see, you know, I think I think we correct to the downside. Um, Unemployment is going to go up. I think things will slow down uh, probably Q2, Q3. Uh, but again, I'm an inflation bull. I'm, a, I'm an optimist. And so I think this uh, reverses course pretty quickly. We can talk about that, but I'll just pause right there. Yeah, well, I like how you framed so much of this in the context of a longer term time horizon. Like you know, oil price, for example, yes, maybe relative to a week ago, prices have crashed, right? If if you know you could call it that. And I agree with you. I would never call it that. But a lot of the headlines that I'm seeing as well, like, you know, credit card balances hitting all-time highs. I mean, we're gonna keep hitting all-time highs. That's sort of history, right? Like we always hit all-time highs and and, yeah. and whatnot. Delinquencies are rising, but relative to the previous 30 years, they're actually low. Uh, you know, they're below the average over the previous 30 years. So you can grab the slice of the last two years and say, credit card delinquencies are, you know, running away. But when you pan out, you're like, actually, we're far below the 30 year average. That's exactly uh, right, Jay. Yeah. Auto loan delinquency, same thing, makes for good headlines. But you know, this, this isn't quite systemic yet. And I wouldn't call it that. What, what do you mean by inflation bull, Mark? Walk me through this, this idea a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, we saw, obviously, we, we we saw in 2020, you know, the Fed saying uh, inflation is transitory. It's not here. Well, if you look back further to your point, zooming out, um, the problem is that uh, for the Fed, not for you and I, it was a different conversation. But the problem for the Fed is that we were ha they weren't able to get the inflation they wanted. You know, through the mid 2010s, 2015, 2016, 2018, the, the story was we can't get inflation. We can't get enough inflation. So we were having this massive deflationary uh, move because of um, technology, because of offshoring, because of globalization. It had this massive deflationary effect. And so the Fed couldn't get the inflation. And if you remember back in uh, 2019, early 2020, the story 
was what the Fed said is uh, we can't get the inflation. We're going to let it run hot, if you remember Jay, uh, um, Jay Powell saying that. And so what he meant was we can't get to the 2% that we want, so we're just going to overshoot the target and we're going to average it out. So, hey, right. we've been at zero for the last couple of years. We're going to get to four or five. And we're just going to call it an average of two. So that's what he said. So that, that was the story for years. We couldn't get the inflation. Well, then obviously inflation took off. Uh, then it became you know, transitory is going to go away. And then all of a sudden, oh, crap, we have a big problem. Um, inflation in the U.S. peaked C measured by CPI at what, 9.1% in September of last year. Um, and then it started coming down. And I've been very vocal for over a year on my video saying, look, this is the lowest inflation we're going to see for the for the rest of the decade. So uh, remember, as I said earlier, nothing goes up or down in a straight line. So of course, uh, it's, it's it's not going to go straight up. So it's, it's, it's retreating. If we look back to the 70s and the 40s, when we had really big uh, problems with inflation, you see that inflation sort of comes in waves. Right. So we have disinflation. So it slowed down. So we got it back down again, as measured by three CPI down into threes. However, in January of this year, the BLS Bureau of Labor Statistics, which uh, makes the CPI basket for the US changed the calculation. So uh, surprise, surprise, they've changed the calculation many times. Um, so it did come from nine down to one. Of course, that was after it was recalculated, whatever, but it was disinflationary and it's going back up. Why do I say that I, why do I think that it's going to be the lowest inflation? The reason why is because the reason why inflation came down was because of globalization, just in time supply chains and technology advancements. And now we're seeing the opposite effect. Now we're seeing deglobalization. Right uh, now we have uh, at this deglobalization, the United States is re onshoring things. Now we're having competition instead of cooperation. The, the rise of the BRICS rose up. President Xi's there at the BRICS summit in August, and he said, um, "We want the we want the BRICS to rise up and challenge the G7." That's what he said. Not cooperate, not work with, no challenge, co compete against the G7, right? Um, that is uh, inflationary. What happens is, you know, we, we're seeing these trade wars. The U.S. took the chips away, level two, level three chips from China. China bans gallium and geranium exports to the United States. Now, Russia and OPEC Plus are, are lowering the... Uh, the, the amount of oil they're producing. As a matter of fact, just last week, and this hasn't been talked about enough, just last week, Russia... Um, banned all exports of diesel and distillates. Yeah, like, that is I that. massive. I don't think people understand just how big of a deal that is. Like every single thing that you use in your life has to be transported. Um, and so this is going to continue. We're going to continue to see this multipolar world play out, in my opinion. I think the world, you know, right now we have probably, we, we've been this sort of global homogeny in the United States, this singular polar world, the G7, if you will, obviously our neighbors in the north of Canada in on that. And now we're seeing for sure, you know, Russia, China, the, the rise of the BRICS, we're breaking into four or five probably different jurisdictions. And everyone's going to be competing against each other. And we've gone from these just-in-time supply chains where everybody works together collaboratively to now just-in-case, like, oh, shoot, I better cover my ass. And so we're seeing this. So we're seeing, for example, China has bought up half of all the lithium mines in the world. Yeah. Everyone's fighting over resources. We saw um, – yeah. Poland is now uh, pulling out of NATO and they don't want to deal with Ukraine anymore because they're worried about their grain shipments. And so now the United States had to give Poland concessions to try to keep them on board. Uh, Russia now wants to um, ban or not wants to ban exports of diesel because they need to worry about their own country and their own economy. And so all everyone's going to start worrying about themselves, making sure they have enough resources. Even when when uh, when when China banned the exports of the gallium and geranium, they said in the in the release why should we continue to give up our scarce limited resources to countries that aren't friendly to us? And so this is going to continue to play out and it's going to push prices up. It just is. It's the opposite of what we've seen over the last decade. Um, these these $100,000 jobs in the US that were shipped overseas for $20,000 are coming back. This $100 part that we now make in China for eight bucks is coming back. Um, and uh, we've seen, you know, just recently, just this year, we've seen... Um, I. Iran has uh, hijacked two U.S. oil tankers. <laughs> the U.S. took one oil tanker back. Like that's going to continue. That's inflationary. So I think I think the future, at least for the rest of the decade, is highly inflationary. Uh, of course, then we can add in you know the rise of the BRICS and different currencies, the rise of cryptocurrencies and stablecoins, and that also creates massive inflationary pressure on the dollar. Uh, so we could sit here and dig into that even more, but. 
Uh, those are reasons why I think there's massive inflation. Then we can add in uh, what I think is the uh, the probably the biggest inflationary pressure, um, and this is the the third inevitability. So it, we have a saying here in the United States: uh, "There's two things in life that are certain: death and taxes." And now there's money printing. And right. So if you just look, if you just look at the, if you just look at the situation that we're in as as the United States, but also Canada, also the UK, also can I mean every country. Look at China. China's even worse. Um, the massive amounts of debt that we have, we're we're technically in a death spiral at this point. And so uh, the problem that the Fed has has is that they've been trying to crush demand to bring inflation down. And I think what the Fed has just done with this last pause um, last week was sort of throwing in the towel. And they realized, shoot, you know, we can't really, we can continue crushing demand, but the inflation is not coming from the consumer. It's the government, it's the treasury that's spending all the money. In the US, our, our fiscal spending has increased by 50% since the pandemic, 50% increase in spending. And so what's happening is as they're spending that money, at the same time, the Fed crushing demand has lowered tax receipts. So now the treasury brings in less revenue. But because interest rates went up, they have more interest expense and they've increased spending by 50%. And the more debt they take on to cover the deficit, we've hit now a $2 trillion deficit, the more debt they bring on to pay that deficit, that creates even more inflation. So we're in this death debt spiral. So all of these factors combined, uh, the, the, there's just no way out of it. It's just massive inflationary. I publish a weekly newsletter every Sunday. If you would like to subscribe, hit the link right beneath this video. Now, I'm an investor, but I don't write about managing money. I write about managing my mind. Without question, the hardest and most important part of allocating capital through volatility and getting some back. If you wanna read my newsletter, hit the link right beneath this video. I know you'll love it. Now, back to the interview, enjoy. Okay, yeah, and uh, the diesel announcement is massive. And you're right; it didn't get a lot of attention. But as you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but diesel's already at all time highs for this time of year, and up sixty percent in Europe just since the summer. So yeah. limiting exports of diesel and gas, you know, it's it's very consequential. I have very. a hard time seeing anything outside of massive rising prices like six months down the road because, to your point. When the price of energy goes up, the price of everything goes up, right? If you need to grow it, manufacture it, move it, you know, diesel matters, right? And uh, and we're already struggling to produce enough that we need globally. Now, uh, the the counter argument to rising energy prices would be that we're facing some kind of a global coordinated recession, and this is going to crush demand, and demand destruction will crush prices. Uh, I don't I don't buy into that because when I look at global oil demand through like the 2008 financial crisis, like consumption dropped by slightly over 1% on a global level. This is the great financial crisis. Like, you know, yeah. 2020 when we had everybody locked in their homes, you know, like planes grounded, trains shuttered, all this global consumption dropped by 8% and bounced back very, very quickly. So do you do you think I'm missing something there, Mark, or, you know, on the heels of a global coordinated recession, could we see demand destruction that actually creates something significant? Or do you think that's a, a misnomer? I, I think it's a misnomer. And the reason why I would say that is because, you know, to your point in 2008, that was the great financial crisis, which I want to compare. Uh, I want to use that as a gauge to look at what the future holds. So we'll come back to that. But okay. that was... Um, First of all, that was the greatest recession we've seen um, in history so far, right? Um, that lasted, uh, the markets took seven years to bounce back from that. Um, and to your point, it barely dropped, right? But it's also important to note that the world wasn't as connected back then as it is today. So we didn't have all this global shipping and global supply chains and parts being shipped. I mean, just this iPhone has parts from six continents. We didn't have this back then. The iPhone was just invented, right? Um, in 2007. So um, the world was a lot different back then. We use way more today. We're way more connected. We need it way more than we did back then. So I think that's a big piece. The other piece is that you know prices are always a, the equilibrium of supply and demand. And so sure, while global demand might drop, OPEC plus has shown that they're willing to also drop the supply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, if, if, uh, because what's happening is, and this is, th- these are all connected issues. Uh, I'm, I'm working on, I'm going to go speak at Bitcoin Amsterdam in two weeks. And my talk is uh, the end of the international monetary order. And basically, you know, we're looking at the way the money system, the monetary order has shifted. And we went where gold was money, right? And then we went to where uh, the last 50 years, we've kind of been in this fiat money system. And now I believe we're going back into this kind of commodity money, because as I said, like China wants to buy the lithium, they'd rather have the lithium in the ground. Um, oh, uh, Saudi Arabia said, we'd rather keep the oil in the ground. We don't want your US treasuries. We don't want paper. We'd rather just keep the commodities, right? Even GM here in the United States spent $650 million on lithium mines. They'd rather have the, the commodity in the ground than the money. And so that's a big fundamental shift. And so Saudi Arabia or Russia, they're like, why would we continue to pump out the same amount of oil for 80 bucks, 70 bucks, 60 bucks, 50 big, 40 bucks. Why don't we just keep the oil in the ground and keep the prices up? Um, now we could argue the other side, well, but they need the money to run the government. And so they're going to have to pump, even if it's for less money, we could play these games and, and we don't know. We're just making assumptions, obviously. But in my opinion, I would agree with you. I think, um, as we've seen in past recessions, the demand side hasn't dropped enough. And if they needed to, the supply side could drop enough to kind of maintain that. Um, right. Yeah. And and uh, what 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 we're seeing too, Jay, is like we're seeing this disconnection. So look, just this week we saw the Dixie, the dollar index, is shooting higher, but yet so is oil at the same time. And gold has maintained its its level. So that's pretty interesting. And what we're seeing is like the FX markets are breaking apart from the commodity markets. And I think people are starting to realize this. Like we would rather have commodities than the FX. We'd rather have the commodities than the paper. So I think it's a fundamental shift that we're witnessing right now. And I think it continues to play out. Okay. So that's a great segue. I know you're you're heading to Amsterdam to give that keynote. I'd love to catch a sneak preview, you know, the end of the international monetary order as we know it. What what are the highlights, Mark? Like where should we start if we're going to pick this subject apart apart a little bit? Yeah, well, it starts with, you know, understanding the monetary order that we have today, which is obviously this dollar homogeny um, and the dollar obviously took over from the pound sterling, you know, about 100 years ago. But really, it was this uh, it was it was really understanding that we had this dollar homogeny, but it was backed by gold. So you still had this commodity money, if you will. So all of history was basically commodity money, right? It was backed by gold. Um, and then in 1971, the, the system changed as I sort of led on to, which is we went into this kind of like paper money era. So the last 50 years have been dominated by this. Uh, Zoltan Pozar calls it like inside money, he calls it. Um, but then the world really has been waking up to this for a long time. Russia started de-dollarizing back in like 2013, 2014. China really started de-dollarizing back in like 2008, 2009. Um, and so over the last decade, they've been slowly moving away. And so uh, we saw the euro get introduced. That took a big chunk out of the US dollars um, power. Uh, but now we see, you know, this has continued to accelerate. It really got put on blast when Russia had their bank account seized, right? So when Russia's accounts were seized, the whole world said, oh, shoot, if there's three superpowers in the world and with nuclear weapons, and one of them just had their bank account seized, what hope do I have? And so that really woke the world up to like, shoot, we better find another option. And so what we've seen over the last several years is net selling of treasuries and net buying of gold. And not just gold, but other commodities, as we talked about, lithium mines and you know, hanging on to my oil, hanging on to my gallium, geranium, all those things. So now like we're starting to see the shift where there's less and less treasury buying and there's more and more money going into reserve assets or commodities. Now, um, dollar bulls will argue with me, like uh, Brent Johnson, my good friend, by the way, um, you know, he's going to say, but look, the last treasury auction had record demand. Yeah, but look where the demand came from. It's not coming from China or Russia or Saudi Arabia or Brazil. It's not coming from any of those countries. It's coming from Luxembourg. <laughs> it's coming from Switzerland and it's coming from the banks. That's where it's coming from. It's not coming from those other countries. So sure, it did have record demand. I'll give you that. There's more demand for dollars than there ever has been. Yes, but you have to look at where the demand's coming from. I think that's a big key. And so the dollar bulls are going to tell you that the death of the dollar is greatly exaggerated because there's no replacement for the world reserve currency, meaning the dollar is more, the dollar is a currency, but really the dollar is a payment network. So using the SWIFT system uh, we and the correspondent bank system, dollars can move anywhere in the world. And then the United States has the deepest, most liquid bond market for these sovereigns to invest into. And, and that's 100% right. And China 
There's no way China's going to take that. They don't even want it, I would argue. Uh, Ru- there's no way Russia's going to do it. Like, there's no other challenger. There's not. So I agree with the dollar bulls. There's absolutely not. But as we saw at the BRICS summit, they they urged each nation to trade in their own currency. Okay, so the dollar bulls say, fine. Well, that's currency, but that's not reserve assets. Okay, right. Uh, so they can trade in their own currency, but what are they going to reserve in? What are they going to store their wealth in, right? Uh, there's no replacement for the U.S. Treasury market. There's not. I agree. But there is oil. <laughs> There is gold. There is natural resources. And that's what they're turning back to, which is why we're seeing net selling of treasuries and net buying of gold. Okay. So this is this transition. Um, you know, a lot of people thought that the BRICS would announce this uh, gold backed currency. They said before the meeting they weren't going to do that. Um, and I don't think that would really work. I think we're at this point that's very interesting in time, Jay, because um, these nations are realizing we, we're not safe if we store our wealth in dollars. Yeah. One, they can take them from us whenever they want. Two, um, those dollars are losing value so fast that we're losing purchasing power. So what do we do? Well, I don't want my dollar seized and I don't want them to lose value. So I'll just hold the commodities because I think the commodities will be worth more in the future. That's essentially what they're saying, right? They're long commodities, short the dollar. Um, but but what's interesting is what options do they have? Well, they have commodities and, and they have gold. But the problem that I have, Jay, and and you know, both of us are gold bugs. Uh, I was a gold bug. I'm, I really consider myself more of like a sound money uh, advocate at this point now. Uh, but the problem with gold is that gold already failed. Gold didn't work. Gold failed because of the centralization that's required. In order for gold to work, we live in a digital age today. We live in the information age. Gold worked in like an old age, but as soon as the world became connected, gold had to go into banks and banks had to add layer two claims, IOUs to gold to add velocity to the money, right? Because what happened is we sped up the transaction times, but the settlement times were still very slow. So now, because we had the telegram in the late 1800s, we had the phone in the early 1900s, we could do transactions very quickly, but to settle was very slow, right? I can call you up on the telegram tat, 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 or on the phone, and we could do an, a deal across the country, across the world with so the transaction sped up, but to settle that transaction, to ship gold across the ocean took a long time. So we went into a ledger system. The ledger system actually started in the 1500s, 1400s. It was interesting. I uh, This summer, we spent almost a month. I took my family for almost a month to um, Europe. And we went to uh, Florence, which was the birthplace of the modern monetary system where the ledger and double entry accounting was invented. It was pretty cool. Uh, but anyway, um, so gold, um, we, we moved into a world that had instant uh, faster transaction times, but still slow settlement. So gold went into the bank. They gave us IOUs, and they used ledgers to speed up that. But it wasn't final settlement, right? That centralization caused, obviously, massive problems. One, a lot of manipulation. They said they had more gold than they did. And then ultimately, in 1933, uh, the government, the U.S. government decided not to let people have gold anymore, and they just took it away. So that's why gold failed, in my opinion. And so we're moving back into this world where we don't trust U.S. treasuries. So let's go back to gold. But how do we trust gold? China was found to have a bunch of fake gold you know, a year or two ago. So how do we, how do I know I'm going to do a deal with you? How do I know that you have the gold that you say you do? How do I know that you're going to deliver the gold to me? Um, and we're going to go backwards in time. So the world is advancing forward technologically, but we're moving backwards in technology with money. And we know it won't work because transaction times have only gotten faster. So right? let me, let me ask a question at this point, Mark, just to make sure I'm I'm sort of understanding your your gold failed thesis. I want to make sure I've got this. So, you know, gold could have continued to work as long as, you know, even though um, transaction times need to become faster, as long as globalization continues, because kind of on the back of globalization, you're in an era of trust, fragile as it might have been. You can maybe trust that one or two powerful nations have the gold they say they do. They'll make good on their IOUs. And if not, trade is strong enough to support that system. But in an era of deglobalization, we've lost that trust. That era of trust is over, I believe. Uh, Fragmented geopolitical lines, a lot more suspicion about who we're dealing with. And therefore, we can't just rest assured that you've got the asset you claim you do. We need to take possession. And taking possession of that amount of a physical commodity is too complex. And that's why gold couldn't function in this new era. Do I understand that correctly? 
Yeah. So um, sort of, right. So first of all, trust is very fragile, right? So you know this, like uh, if uh, your business partner, you you catch your business partner embezzling from you, (laughs) like you're never going to do business with that guy again. This is not going to happen. You know, if you, if you find out your wife's been having an affair, like, you know, like to get trust back is like almost impossible. It happens sometimes, but there's always probably that little doubt in the back of your mind. So trust is very fragile. Uh, my father told me when I was a kid, it takes your life to build up a reputation. It takes one time to, to destroy it. Right. Yeah. Um, and the U S has destroyed it. How many times? So they seized gold in 1933 in 1971, France was sending their warships over to collect the gold. And Richard Nixon says, Nope, no gold for you. Right. Like how many times does the world have to realize this? And now the U S is like sanctions on you, sanctions on you, sanctions on you. Um, um, and it's been become weaponized. So I just think, to, and you agreed with, I think you said that, you know, you believe trust is gone. Now, back when we were still on a gold standard, uh, there were airplanes sending gold shipments across seas and they were settling pretty quickly. So Andy Sheckman, if you know who that is, you probably had him on your show. He's a, he's a great, uh, him and I have gone round and round on this. You know, he thinks we'll go back to that and, you know, we'll settle quarterly, right? And so we'll keep tabs and once a quarter we have to settle. And if you don't settle with me, then I cut you off. And sure, sure. we can do that. Like sure. a movie, right? Hey, give me the drugs. No, give me the money. No, you give me the drugs. Yeah. No, you give me the, like we can do that. But how does that make sense in this, in this world? Um, so that's the era that we're going into. And I think that's the next step. So I do think that we're seeing record gold demand because of this exact issue. We're also seeing record demand in commodities as well. So this is the interim step, but over the long term, it's going to fail for the exact same reasons that it failed before. So I think it's the next logical step, but I think the next logical step, so now this goes back to the time frame question, is in a world, in a digital world, in an information world where we have instant transaction time, we should also have instant final settlement. And in a world where trust is lost, we need a trustless system. And if we can't trust someone to maintain a ledger, we need a ledger that nobody can control. Right. Yes. So uh, I look at problems and solutions like. The problem is we don't have trust. The problem is we can't trust who controls the ledger. The problem is we have instant settlement, so we need instant um, instant transaction, we need instant settlement. So those are problems. How do we solve it? Well, we need something that can settle instantly. We need something that's not trust, uh, that doesn't require trust. We need something that nobody can control. So that would be a solution to these problems that we have. And then I would just say, well, I see a solution for that. (laughs) (laughs) I think I know what it is. Okay, let me let me just uh, recap some of this then. So, so. Central banks are stockpiling gold right now at record rates. And you're saying this is the interim step, which makes sense. I mean, gold's historically been the interim step, right? Between the shifting of empires, you gravitate towards that historic safe haven asset class without the counterparty risk, all of this stuff. And I believe we're heading through one of those transition periods right now. We're in the decline of the American empire. I'm not saying it's going to crash this decade, but you know, we're on our way to the next, whatever happens next, right? That's what I believe. Yep. Um, you know, Luke Roman's got a great, great quote. He says, there's very few times in history when you need to own gold, but when those times occur, it's about the only thing you want to own. Maybe yeah. that's, you know, what we're kind of looking at right now is you, you don't know what's coming next, but you know, we're departing what we, what we've had for the last 40 years. And so yeah, you hit the lifeboat for the interim, right? And what you're saying is that it's a good interim bet, but it's not going to take us to the next evolution of our global economy. Um, so we're seeing all kinds of alternatives proposed by BRICS nations, like commodity backs, baskets. Uh, you know, th- there's a lot of complications if countries just want to start buying commodities with their own currency because um, most currencies aren't in high demand at all, right? So why is why are blockchain? Why okay? If you're going to a Bitcoin-based standard with this thesis, which you might be, and if you're not, let me know. Why has Bitcoin not come up in the BRICS conversation yet in terms of all sorts of alternatives that we've seen put on the table? Yeah. Um, so I, I am I am suggesting Bitcoin, by the way. Um, yeah. So I think a part of the interim step is is gold, but I think it's also CBDCs. So okay. I, didn't, I, I didn't touch on that yet. So uh, obviously, there's lots of talk of CBDCs everywhere. We know that uh, per the BIS, almost every nation in the world is working on some sort of a CBDC project. Um, but what's really transpired in the last you know six, eight months or so is a project called Project Embridge. And basically, the BIS has worked with uh, some Asian countries, China, Hong Kong, Singapore, but also the UAE, uh, to build out this Project Embridge. And basically, Embridge is like a hub where each nation would have their own CBDC, their own currency, as the, the BRICS said, hey, everyone should trade their own currency. But then all these central currencies can go into this hub. 
this this Enbridge, and they can be swapped one for one uh, for their uh, currencies. So each nation would have their own currency and manage their own currency, and then this hub would then swap it out. It's sort of like what the Bretton Woods Agreement, John Maynard Keynes had recommended um, with this Bancor um, to kind of have this situation where each nation has their own currency and they trade it. And so they're trying to build this out digitally through CBDCs. And so I think it's important to understand that because what, what we see is that, again, to the dollar bulls, um, they say, and, and I'm bullish on the dollar because I see inflation. Uh, I just think that the, that, it, that it doesn't last eventually, right? And I will say uh, one thing that Brent and I do agree on um, – is really the long-term vision of the dollar. Um, he likes to pound the table because he just wants to tell people this is not imminent. It's not happening tomorrow. And I would agree. The dollar took over from the pound sterling over a hundred years ago. And the pound sterling is still the third most used currency in the world. And yep. they don't even produce anything. Good perspective. So, uh, so just for perspective on that, but back to this uh, topic. Um, so remember, we can't replace the dollar because we don't have the SWIFT system. We don't have the correspondent banking system. And you can't just pull the dollar out and plug in a, a yuan or a yen, right? But what you can do is leapfrog past it. So the United States, we had a wired telephone system. We had the internet pretty quickly. Africa never had wired telephones. They leapfrog and went straight to wireless. And so we, you can't replace this network, this dollar payment network, but you can just leapfrog straight back to a new type of technology. And that would be the CBD system with like a project Enbridge. Okay. But that, so that is the, also the interim step. So like going back to gold and trying to build out this new system at the same time, but that, that fails as well. And the reason why that fails is because it's still fiat money. The real problem is that the governments need, you can't print your way to wealth, right? The real problem is that the money is broken. The real problem is fiat money that the governments can continue to print at will. It's the expanding of the monetary system without the expanding of goods and services. Now, I, I want to make sure we're clear on that because it's not just gold. So I think I was uh, talking about this on a show I was on, I think last week, a lot of people compare the U.S. decline as to like the Roman Empire decline, which is a lot of parallels. But maybe a more uh, comparable um, explanation or, or look would be at the Spanish Empire. Interesting. Okay. Because the Spanish Empire actually was more global. They controlled the oceans. They had ports all over the world. But what re what Spain really did see what what Rome did was they debased their currency, right? So they took it from 100% silver to 90% silver. So they inflated the money supply by 10%, right? And they continued all the way down, right, for over 200 years. What Spain did is Spain went over to South America. Spain went to Peru, and they discovered mass amounts of silver. And they brought all that silver back to Spain and increased, inflated the money supply with specie, with gold and silver. So for the gold bugs, they're like, oh, but gold is money. Well, yeah, it doesn't matter when you increase the currency, when you increase the money supply without sure. increasing the goods and services. It doesn't matter if it's gold. The reason why gold has worked good in more modern era is because we've kind of tapped out all the easy access gold. And so there's a real cost of capital. So there's limited supply growth. And so it works from that standpoint. But in Spain, they just found massive amounts of silver, brought it over, yeah, rapidly yeah, yeah. increased the currency supply, created massive inflation. Yeah. And so um, I, I think it's important to understand that it's not just gold. If you rapidly increase the currency or the money supply, uh, we have that problem. So, the, so CBDCs will be the exact same thing. They can just click a button, add more currency units, and we have so, so it doesn't that doesn't fix the problem either. So I think the interim step is going back to gold, um, other types of commodities, uh, keep the oil on the ground, so to speak, um, and then there's this CBDC push that will happen as well. But that ultimately fails as well because again, it's just fiat. It's just fiat. Okay, okay. Um, so I I want to uh, you know what, Mark, I need to understand why you are so confident that CBDC will fail so quickly um, because it provides a lot of incentives, right? If you can just inject, I mean, I see it as a very easy project to get buy-in to CBDCs from the general public because you can mouse click money all day long. You can inject stimulus at will. Um, you know, you look at the current balance sheets of most Western consumers, they're really unhealthy. And so, you know, a little bump in income is enough to convince anybody to do almost anything these days. You know, Walk me through just a, in a bit more detail, yeah. Um, why CBDCs, as they're presently supposed, presently proposed, are not sustainable. 
And in addition to just it's the it's the next fiat system that will will sort of devalue eventually and does yeah. that make sense? Well, so first of all, I would certainly agree with you. Um, if the if my government said, hey, download this app and download these CBDCs and there's $2,000 of free money for you, sure, yeah. I'm going to download that. Why wouldn't I? Of course, right? So sure, the incentives are there. Um, but let's just remove... And, and so I said CBDCs are essentially fiat, meaning fiat... So fiat is by decree. So fiat means by decree, that means that it has value because we say it has value, right? Uh, so essentially, the dollar system that we have today, uh, the Fed just creates you know more monetary units and more reserves to the banks, and the banks create more money through this debt-based system. Um, if you take out the CBDC part and just realize it's exactly the same thing, sure, they can get money to you faster. Sure, they can speed up that feedback mechanism. Yeah. But I would just ask you back to sort of like a first principles level, why is our monetary system failing right now? If all we had to do is give more money to the people faster and everybody would be rich, mm -hmm. why don't we just do that? I mean, we yeah, saw yeah. the stimmy, we saw the stimmy get out in weeks in 2020, but that's what caused the problem. That's the that that uh, as we started the call, uh, I talked about how uh, we had this trend line and we went way over the trend line because they pumped out 10 trillion dollars in you know 24 months. And so if just giving more pe people more money and more money faster solved the problem, we can do that right now. Sure, maybe it speeds it up even faster. Great, so that we have more inflation faster. Um, but that's not what it is. Wealth is goods and services. And so that's why it fails. It, it's the exact same thing. Yes, it's faster. Yes, there's more control. Yes, I can make sure that you don't hoard it and that you, if you don't spend it by Friday, it comes back to me. Sure, so I can speed up the velocity, but all that does is speed up the inflation. Okay, yes, 100% agree with you there. So I guess to rephrase my question, the CBDC empire, can we call it that, will replace the US dollar empire. But am I correct to think about the CBDC, CBDC stage as like the next reserve currency for the time that it exists? This is the next empire, essentially. And who is the issuing government? Who is the issuing party of the dominant CBDC? Well, uh, I think it goes back to sort of like an IM, but like, like I said, it really kind of follows back on what the IMF had created in the Bretton Woods Agreement, um, which is like an SDR basket. So each nation yeah. has their own currency and then it swaps. That's what, like I said, John Maynard Keynes had produced in this Bancor okay. idea that, that 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 actually didn't happen. Uh, but each nation sort of floats their own currency and then it swaps through this project Enbridge. So the IMF or the BIS is this hub that runs this basket that allows each nation to swap their currencies. Okay. Thank you. I'm with yeah. you. All right. So, All so, right. so, so nations, not every nation in the world gives up and says, okay, we're just using this one world currency. I think that's actually the opposite. So I think everyone's looking for this. What's the next reserve currency, Jay? What's yeah. the next one? Yeah. There isn't, there isn't one. Yeah. Because the world's decentralizing now, now over what time frame? over the next 10, 20 years, there isn't one. Uh, what do I? What do you mean by that, Mark? Well, I know thousands of people whose reserve today is Bitcoin. Sure. Michael Saylor at Michael Strategy has made their reserve asset Bitcoin. El yeah. Salvador has made their reserve asset Bitcoin. Yeah. So, uh, but but the U.S. is treasuries, and other nations are gold, and Saudi Arabia is oil, and you might be in silver. And so like the world continues to decentralize and we're going to see lots of this happen, right? It's going to continue to decentralize and there's not going to be one power from on high declare this is the next reserve currency. Not for a long time. Not in my opinion. Okay. Got it. So multipolarity for the foreseeable future. Yeah. And uh, with that, there's a bit of, okay, a bit of complexity and difficult to predict. Um, I want to jump back to a comment that I made about how I think we're entering the end stages of the American empire, you know, and, you know, just want to preface this by saying I'm debating moving to the U S like in near term. So I'm not, I'm not a doom and gloomer by any stretch, but all empires fail. You referenced the Spanish empire in the last 600 years. I and mean, what have we seen the Portuguese empire, Spanish, Dutch, UK, now it's the American empire. They've all gone the same way. And, and a lot of them are still lovely places to visit. Madrid's still lovely. London's still lovely. Amsterdam's still lovely, even though these empires have come and gone. So the end of the American empire isn't the um, the end of high quality of life in, in America. But where do you land on, on this concept, Mark? You know, if you were to say we're in X inning of the American empire, where might you point to? Uh, well, like I said, I think it's most comparable more to Spain. Um, uh, the second reason why I think it's comparable to Spain is one, just like Spain brought in more silver, the U.S. has printed more dollars. So it's so, so very similar there. 
Um, not like uh, not not as much as Rome did. It was a different a different phenomenon where they increased the currency supply, which I guess Rome sort of did by debasing as well. But I think another comparable piece that's important to understand is um, what Spain had during their empire was they had the inquisitions. It was the church and state that controlled everything. And they were in power at the time when the printing press had democratized access to information. And anyone who got the Bible off the printing press said, wait a minute, you guys have been lying to us this whole time. They were labeled heretics uh, and they were put to death. There was the, you know, the inquisitions. Sp Spain was trying to send out, um, you know, religion to the world. Sort of like the U.S. is trying to send out democracy to the world. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. U.S. is sending out wokeness to the world. The U.S. is telling Africa that they have to allow same-sex marriages and child transitioning in Africa is like, what? No, uh, that ain't freaking out. What, what are you kidding? Are you kidding me? They're telling that to Catholic nations in South America. They're telling that to uh, the Polish, the Polish, even Russia. That's what Vladimir Putin has been hitting on. He said, quote, he said, uh, you think that this is progress? This is not progress. This is the same dogmas that were taught by Marx and Engels a hundred years ago. He said, you think that by just breaking the barrier between men and women by breaking down the family is progress. So like the whole world sees this. So the U S is exporting this religion, just like the Spanish was exporting religion. Yeah. The Spanish had to deal with this printing press, this technology that democratized access to information. And they tried to, they tried to stop that by labeling heretics, heresy, killing people. The U S is creating this global censorship complex and trying to stop the flow of information. So it's the same thing. That, that's why I think it's much more comparable. Uh, so where are we at in this? Um, I made a video just last week, a little bit off topic. I typically you know, talk about financial topics, uh, but I made a video talking about this immigration problem that we're seeing in the United States and we're seeing over in, in Europe as well. And um, you know, this is going to probably be a little bit off topic for some people. Uh, but again, if you zoom out and you take a look at the picture of things, um, People might have heard of the name George Soros before, um, and there's a lot of controversy around George Soros. Is he as evil as he is made out to be by media, or is he really this nice guy? Well, let's not try to put a bunch of opinion there. Let's just look at some facts. So he got famously wealthy by, uh, you know, destroying the government of England. Yeah, no big deal. Made a billion dollars in a day. Uh, mm -hmm. And he's continued to break government after government after government. That's how he makes his money. He takes them down, and then he makes money building them back up. The name of his nonprofit is called Open Societies. That's the name of it. The whole point of Open Societies is, oh, uh, yeah, having open societies, having no borders. That's the whole point. Um, he funds these types of things. Um, there's uh, a, a mountain of evidence showing, I mean, obviously, he's backed Obama's kind of cl claim to fame, you know, his, his whole rise through history. Uh, Obama ran on a campaign saying that he was going to fundamentally transform Form America. That was his quote, fundamentally transformed. What does that mean? I, I thought the foundation of America based off of the constitution uh, was pretty good, but he wanted to fundamentally transform that. Well, if you look at what happened during Obama's reign, we have to go back a little bit in history. Uh, well, first of all, let me put a pin in this. Where did Obama go to college? Supposedly uh, people that went to college with Obama said he was never there, but he said he went to Columbia. Um, and I don't want to get into this whole birther thing. I don't want to get into like controvert, con you know, conspiratorial stuff, but let's just talk about facts. So he, he, he said he went to Columbia. Apparently that's where he graduated college. Um, and we'll come back to that. Um, when he got in power, if you remember, it was like 2011, 2012, um, you're not an American. You probably don't remember, but, um, in Syria, the president had gassed their people. And he said, hey, we have to go. America has to go and stand up for these people. And the American people were like, no, no, no more war. We don't want war. We don't want war. Well, so Obama did what every what the U.S. always does is we armed the rebels. <laughs> so we started sending weapons to ISIS and we yeah. funded ISIS to go in there and disrupt Syria. And then you remember ISIS 2012, 13, 14, 15, ISIS just started tearing through the Middle East, killing hundreds of thousands of Christians. Uh, Syria became this war zone. Well, going into the election, in the 2016 election with Trump, if you remember, that came to a head. Russia started going into Syria and Russia was going, hey, it's the Americans. It's the Americans that are doing this. Russia is like, it's, it's, they're, they're funding ISIS. They're the ones that are causing this. And then, oh, that's Russian disinformation, blah, blah, blah. But that was a story that was being told. Um, and we'll see if that's true. But um, if you remember, as soon as um, Trump became president, ISIS was gone, just just gone. 
just check your history books. Where did it go all of a sudden? Well, what happened is that sent tens of millions of migrants north. As ISIS wiped out the Middle East, all tens of millions of migrants went north. And it completely changed the complex of France, of the UK, of Sweden. Sweden has like the highest rape ratio in the world right now. Like what? Huh. So all of these countries, Germany, France, UK, Sweden, have all been completely changed based off of that migration of the South. Oh, like an open society? Meaning like we mix everybody together with no borders, sort of? Yeah. Now, hold that, hold that frame. Then we had Trump. ISIS went away. Now we can argue that Obama's back in power, uh, Obama, the Obama-Biden administration. Um, and now we have the same thing happening, but now it's the South. Global South is now coming into the United States. 300,000 people came across the border last week. I mean, last month, Jay. 300,000 yeah. people in a month. No screening. Now, this is anecdotal, but in July, I went to Spain to go to speak at a mastermind. I was flying from Madrid back to LA, but I had to go through El Salvador. It's like this long way around. I'm getting on my plane in Madrid. It's like a midnight flight or like almost 1 a.m. I'm getting my plane. And like over half the plane is like 20-year-old Black males, Africans. I'm like, what the heck? Like, I've been to El Salvador many times because I'm a surfer. So I love going down there, the great waves down there. Um, but <laughs> other than going there for surfing, there's not a whole lot of reasons to go to like El Salvador, right? So yeah. I'm like, what the heck are all these like 20 year old men doing flying to like El Salvador in the middle of the night? So I started trying to talk to some of them. They didn't speak any English. I could see by their passports, you know, where they're from. And finally, I found some guy that kind of spoke a little bit of English. Oh, they're all flying to El Salvador so they can make their way up to the United States. Okay. And and there many of them, I mean, they they took the whole plane. Many of them were in first class with me. How the heck did they get those tickets? Who's flying them to El Salvador? Why are they coming to the United States? I mean, you've seen the pictures and I'm sure the boats in, in Lampuza being overrun, 18,000 immigrants uh, coming in, right? The boat, just by the boat load. Oh, yeah. Okay. So they're overwhelming the system. Now, um, it at, now let's go back to Columbia. At Columbia, there was professors there, Cloward and his wife Piven, and they wrote a strategy. It's called the Cloward Piven Strategy, and they taught it at Columbia. Obama went to Columbia. Bill Barr, the last district attorney, went to Columbia. Uh, the attorney, uh, U.S. attorney before him, Eric Holder, went to Columbia. Uh, current Secretary of State, uh, Defense Secretary Blinken, went to Columbia. Like all these people went to Columbia, and at Columbia they teach a strategy called the Cloward Piven strategy. And the strategy is to end capitalism, to bring the U.S. down. We have to overwhelm the system. So the goal is to put as many people as you possibly can onto this welfare system until the services can't um, can't hold it anymore and the whole system collapses. Now, I'm not saying that they're doing this intentionally, but I am saying that there is a strategy at Columbia taught and these people went there. <laughs> so I am saying that. That's fact. And I am saying that we had 300,000 people come across the border last week, and we can see in New York City, um, they're spending billions of dollars to deal with this migrant crisis, and New York City is broke. New York City has no money. How are they going to come up with billions of dollars to do this? There was a there, On the news this week, there was a Korea War veteran that got kicked out of his house uh, because they had to put migrants there. Like we're not taking care of our own veterans, but we're taking care of the migrants. Like the system is overwhelmed, Jay. You talked about moving to San Diego. This might uh, change your mind. But if you look on the news, you'll see busloads of, of migrants being shipped to San Diego. And like you can see videos if you go on Twitter because mainstream media won't show it. Um, but you see the buses pulling up and people getting off the buses and people are just like looking around, just like wander. Like they don't even know where to go. They just start wandering out. That's it. Right. Yeah. Right? So you would just ask yourself like uh, why – do we have 7 million people coming across the border illegally every year? The fentanyl is the number one cause of death from 18 to 35 year olds. Um, the, the cartels we know factually are using this as a way to send more drugs in through the border, right? They're helping this happen so they can just continue to push drugs across the border. Who knows what types of terrorists are coming across the border? We have seen a massive increase in attacks on inf critical infrastructure, things like that. Could that be part of it? I don't know. That's opinion. People can draw their own con conclusions. But what we do know is that there's this massive flood. We know that no American wants this to happen. Not one. Yeah. We know that the system can't handle it. So why is it happening? Now, you know, in uh, 
whenever people watch this and we'll see how this shakes out. But as of tomorrow, the government, the U.S. government is going to shut down, depending on this debt ceiling debate. McCarthy on the Republican side said, look, OK, we'll we'll concede. We'll concede. We'll fund the government. The only thing we ask, we'll give you the money. The only thing we ask is we have to do something about the southern border. That's it. Right. Biden right. says no deal. No, no deal. deal. What? Biden. Google this. Fact check me. The Biden administration has been for the last two months has been selling off for pennies on the dollar selling off all the border wall stuff that's been sitting there that got halted and they've been selling it off because they were anticipating regulations coming that would have to cause them to start building again so he's getting rid of it before that happens now jay i'm sure you're a smart enough businessman to understand you've probably been in this situation before if i were to go create like some offshore trust and move all my assets there because there's like a lawsuit filed against me and i were to go move my assets that's like pretty illegal like you don't do that, right? I can't go hide assets when litigation's pending against me. But yet the Biden admin knows that these regulations are coming. So they're selling off all the material as fast as they can. The Biden administration said, so we'll give you the money you need, but we just want something to happen on the board. Well, no deal. So it's clearly intentional, Jay, clearly. And so I don't know, people can draw their own conclusions, but that's where it's happening. So and and, and this goes back to your question. Uh, so this is happening all throughout Europe. And now it's happening all throughout the United States. If we want to know how this plays out, just look at Sweden and just look at what's going on in France. France has been having riots for the last several months because of yeah. the cultures that are clashing, right? So unfortunately, if we want to know where the United States looks like in, a, in five years, just look at those countries right now and we have an idea. And it's, it's not reversible. It's not reversible, right? So uh, there was pictures. Uh, I don't know if you saw them, but you, know, you can see videos of thousands of people coming across the southern border. Um, as they crossed the river, they put up Venezuelan flags. Like we conquered this land. Like literally, they stake flags in the ground. So they're not really coming to assimilate, right? They're coming to conquer. It seems like, and so this changes the makeup of the of of the world forever, forever. So this isn't like a season that we like pass through. This yeah. changes the course of history, is what it does. Now you said like, um, you know, you you reference some of these countries, and sure, like uh, Amsterdam. I'm going there in a couple weeks. I'm sure it's still great, and I'm sure in Sweden and France, there's still plenty of great areas. But for sure, the cities have been impacted, and will never go back to the way they were. Right? Yeah. The countrysides are probably still going to be okay. Um, and so I think it I think it changes the course of the world forever. Um, you know, I think it certainly is overwhelming the United States system and back to why do I, why I'm in an inflation bull. This is highly inflationary, Jay, highly, highly inflationary. New York city has to pay billions of dollars to, to handle this and they don't have it. Where are they going to get the money? Yeah. More debt. I don't believe, I don't believe that a nation with a money printer will, um, allow themselves to go bankrupt. They'll continue to print it until the printing just doesn't work anymore. It's the law of diminishing returns, right? Eventually it just doesn't work. Um, and so. Um, we're going to continue to overwhelm the system. We're going to continue to print money. We're going to continue to pay for it until we just can't do that anymore. So all this is highly inflationary. Uh, it changes the, the the makeup of the world, of the, of the, of the nations. Um, and I'm not saying that the U.S. is going to be a, a war zone. The United States is a big country, man. Uh, but I certainly wouldn't want to be in the cities. Uh, yeah. And I and, and I certainly do think it will change the makeup of the world. Um, so. Anyway, I'll I'll oh, stop man. there for a minute. <laughs> this is good, man. Okay, so. So, you know, there are, I did find myself thinking about some parallels with the Roman Empire, just because you mentioned it a couple of times. And one contributing factor to the fall of Rome was that as their resources became more depleted, they were less capable of providing security to the, the fringe states on the edges of the empire. And as this began to occur, more tribes would come from like north of the Great Wall of China and start raiding these fringe villages and states on the outskirts of the Roman Empire. And so the citizens would start migrating closer to the heart of the empire, thinking it would be safer there. And um, the abundance of immigration overwhelmed the already spent resources. And it was a big factor contributing to uh, the fall of Rome. Um, so a couple questions here that I want to ask. I'm seeing the same videos, man. It blows my mind. And as a Canadian, you know, we don't really wrap our minds around the immigration argument so well because we don't have an illegal immigration problem here. Like we don't have a land border that could really be compromised. Um, we have crazy immigration numbers right now, but it's all it appears to me to all be legal. Like I think we allowed in close to a million immigrants over the last 12 months into a country with 39 million people. That's a massive bump. 
But and, and let me just let me just say, I believe in immigration. We the U.S. Yeah. desperately needs immigration. We desperately need it, and I want it. Yeah, uh, but it needs to be legal immigration. And that's that's why I'm actually like everybody who watches my channel knows I am no fan of our prime minister, but that policy is one I am in favor of because we have a demographic issue. There's only really one way to solve it, and that that might be it. Um. So, so two questions spun out of this. I think you just answered the second one. Actually, I was going to ask you how you marry your libertarian values with um, with this this uh, immigration problem, right? And if you kind of stand for freedom of of movement, then um, how you marry that with with this complication? The way, the way that I marry it is actually pretty simple. Um, in the in in the libertarian value, we don't have a welfare state. So the problem with the immigration uh, is the welfare state. Yeah, if yeah. we didn't have a welfare state, sure, like open up the borders, like no problem, right? Uh, yeah. But but we do. And so all of these people are coming here because they can get onto the welfare system. And that's back to the cloud repayment strategy is overwhelming the system. I mean, Jay, I'm going to be honest, like uh, the US has this crazy high tax situation, even in the United States or in Cal California has the highest state tax, plus we have the federal tax. Uh, at, the, at the top income bracket, you're over half of your income is going to taxes. So over half of my income goes to taxes, and yet 7 million people came into the country this year and don't have to pay taxes. How about I renounce my citizenship? I go down to Mexico and just come across the border illegally. Yeah, yeah, right. Like, why don't I just do that? Why do I have to pay half my income, but 7 million people don't? Yeah. So anyway, that's how I match it. Um, if we didn't have the welfare state, if they, they could come here and work, but they don't get onto our welfare system, uh, they don't overtax our hospitals, our schools, our, uh, our services, et cetera, but that's just not the case. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, those numbers are, you know, we, we throw around tax bracket numbers like that. It's another way to think about it is the first 15 days of each month, you're working for free. You're just showing up, putting in hours, right? Not getting paid for it. That's essentially what that means. Um, and, 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 and then, and then the, the real kick, the real salt in the wound, Jay, is where does that money go? In the state yeah. of California, we're a sanctuary state now. So now that uh, for for child transitioning, so that means that the, that the state of California will now fly kids in to get them transitioned. Well, I object. I don't want my dollars going to that. Uh, you know, Horrifying. Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell was talking about this border, this this uh, de uh, this debt debt limit debate that they're up to, up against right now, and he said that we have to get this deal done because uh, we have to get money to Ukraine. He said it's the number one concern for Americans. I'm like, it is because I bet you it's not even the top twenty for Americans. Um, <laughs> and so I object. I don't want my money going there now. If they were going to take my fifteen days a month and go secure the southern border. Okay, I'll, right. I'll contribute. I'll contribute, but I object. I don't want my money going to those things. I'm with you, man. I'm it's similar. I'm, I'm actually don't have a problem paying taxes if that money is financing things like innovations in our education system. Uh, but right now we've got a prime minister. I feel I feel like it's my you know it's like a toddler stole my credit card and he's just running crazy, yeah. right? And making these announcements. He's so proud of the contributions he's making to the Ukrainian war, forgetting that that's not his money, right? It's my money. It's our money, right? Yeah. It's it's mind boggling. Okay, man. Look, I uh, I I feel like there's a whole. I still want to ask the who conversation, the who question. Like we can we can jump in, but you know we're, we're running on time here, so I want to let you go. But I have a hundred questions about you know who is who would be behind a a, a program like this. You know, and you you sort of began the conversation talking about how Soros has profited handsomely from strategically taking down governments and then rebuilding them. If you were to identify the weak points in America right now, it probably would be overwhelming the welfare system and just contributing further to its own insolvency. Eventually, something's going to break. This seems to be working. Obviously, I'm, I want to dive into the motivations there and who might be I, I, I'll, I'll try to answer that just real quickly because I do have to run as well. And I'm happy to come back and have another coffee hour with you at some point. But um, you know what I'd say real quickly is what happened is... Um, uh, there's a real interesting uh, book. Uh, it's a uh, fifth generation, fifth generation of warfare. And it talks about five different generations of warfare. Uh, generation one is like mano y mano, me and you just duke it out. For generation two is like where we have like, uh, you know, uh, tribes battling each other. Generation three was like, uh, and that, that might lead us to the civil war. Generation three was where um, military became industrialized. So this is the US with the carriers and their tanks and their and their jets. The US dominated that that third generation of warfare. Fourth generation of warfare is where we went into more like guerrilla style warfare we saw in Vietnam and really through like terrorism, where now we have these little cells that just attack from all over. And the US has never won a war since fourth generation of warfare started. Um, and now we're in this fifth generation of warfare, which is more um it's more about information. You don't know where the attack is coming from, but you feel it. 
but you're not sure where it's very interesting. Yeah. I read, read more into that. Um, I did an interview with Dr. Robert Malone. We talked about that specifically. You can go look it up on my channel, Dr. Robert Malone. Uh, but anyway, um, what's in, what's interesting about that is the reason why we can't defeat terrorism, Jay, is because terrorism doesn't have a central command. There's no head of the snake. There's no country. There's no government. It's independent cells that only share an ideology. Yeah. All they do is share an ideology. So, all of these people went to the same schools. I just named off all the people that went to Columbia. Well, not all, several people that went to Columbia. They learned the same things. Klaus Schwab with his young global leaders that took over the cabinet of Canada that he's bragged about. Um, all of these people share the same ideology. So I'm not one of these conspiracy guys that say like Klaus Schwab's running the world. What I think is that most of these people share the same ideologies, just like terrorists share the same ideologies. So it's not like some big coordinated effort where like, oh, my gosh, how the Rothschilds maintain power for the last 100 years. It's not that. It's birds of the feather flock together. If you watch birds fly in this perfect formation of V, they didn't go, hey, Larry, you go in the third row and Bob, you go. No, they just like fly. Right. And they just kind of move together. So all these people like Terra Cells, they share an ideology and they're all just kind of doing their own thing, but all sort of along the same lines. Mm, OK, I like that. I like that. And I think that's a good place for us to cap this but that makes logical sense to me i want to i want to i want to i want to end it with a different note though um i yeah, want to end it back i want to end it back to the financial note because we started talking about the recession and, and all these things i'm an inflation bull so while we certainly could see a big dip happen in the markets and potentially a recession that's in the short term i think over the next three four five years it's way up and to the right. And um, I got a chance to sit down and have a conversation with the legend Porter Stansberry uh, this last week. I've been reading his newsletters for like 15 years. It was like an absolute honor. And we chopped it up for like 45 minutes and little disagreements here and there, and different views or whatever, but mostly agreeing. And um, he said, I said, you know, Porter, the one thing that I always have to keep in the back of my mind, I have to check my bias, is I believe that um, – we believe that um, they want to keep this game going. They want to kick the can down the road. Um, but what if they don't? What if they would want to crash the system? And he's like, Mark, he's like, you're not understanding the way this world works. And this is what really caught my attention because I agree with him on this. He said, uh, it, the world, the story of the history of the world is, it was and is um, corporatism. It's always been big businesses, been in the ear of the government's. Right. It's always been a, 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 a corporatism or fascism, if you will call it that. It's always the big government, the big businesses lobbying the governments and getting their will. And if you look at the world, you know, it, it's pretty clear that the bankers and the, and the global national corporations are the ones sort of pulling the strings. If you look at like Ukraine, like Ukraine's getting chopped up and sold off. I mean, Zelensky was just here last week and met with JP Morgan and Blackstone and BlackRock. And he's selling them access to Ukraine. They're buying up the farmland. They're buying up the resources, commodities, all that, right? So it's always been run by that. And so what Porter said is like, Mark, the world is run by these bankers and corporations, the corporatocracy. Um, they don't want a crash. They need it to continue to go higher. And so when he kind of put it like that, because like I said, I had to kind of check myself, my bias. What if they wanted to crash? And he's like, no, Mark, you're not understanding. If the corporations and the and the bankers kind of push the strings, pull the strings, so to speak, they needed to go up and to the right. And so um, I think, you know, there could be a big crash, a, a flash crash. Uh, in 2008, it took the market. Um, the S&P 500 took them six years to recover. In 2020, it took six months. Right. Uh, uh, you know, in 2008, we saw a trillion dollars of stimulus. In 2020, we saw 10 trillion of stimulus. In 2024, we'll probably see 20 trillion of stimulus. And instead of a six month crash, it might be a two or three month crash. And I think in, in the answer is in two or three years from now, we're way higher. And so I think for most people, they should be focusing on the two or three years out. Assets are higher, homes are higher, commodities are higher. <laughs> prices of, of living are higher. And I'm trying to plan for that. I think um, in Zimbabwe, everybody became a billionaire. Right. But it was 300, but it was 350 billion for an egg. So, yeah, uh, yeah. so I think the goal is to try and stay as long as possible in uh, there's a great book. Uh, it's called When Money Dies. It documents uh, sort of the hyperinflation in the Weimar Republic. And it was sort of like a documentary. And 
people in this Weimar Republic thought that uh, their asset prices had never been so high. I should sell now before prices crash down. So they sold their gold at the peak before it crashed. They sold their homes at the peak before it crashed. And at the end, they had piles of paper that were worth less than wood. And they actually burned the paper in the fireplaces instead of the wood. And they didn't have the assets. And so I think that's where the future is. The future, there's, there's two types of crashes, an inflationary crash and a deflationary crash. And while most people are expecting a deflationary crash, i I'm expecting an inflationary crash. That's how I'm preparing. Yeah, man. Well, in an odd way, this this was a better way to cap it because you made me a bit excited and optimistic. And you know, you could read that comment about you know it's the bankers and the corporations who run the world any way you want to. But you know, one way to interpret that is that it's an entrepreneur's world, right? And uh, and I I'll take that as good news. Uh, there's pros and cons to everything, but um, I think it's still a hustler's world, man. It's an entrepreneur's world, and. And and I'm an, and I said I'm an entrepreneur. I'm an optimist. So uh, yeah. while all this sounds bad, I'm an optimist because big problems mean big solutions and big opportunities. And so you know I'm not this like George Soros like in the world so I can get make money. But we're yeah. gonna have lots of problems and we're gonna need lots of solutions. And to your point, I agree. I'm super bullish on when millions of entrepreneurs' backs are against the wall. Uh, I'm super bullish on the progress we're gonna have. I'm super bullish on the opportunities that are gonna be there. Yes, it's bad, but. But storms in Fiji that wipe out islands create great waves that I surf on. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to ride those waves. I like it, man. All right, dude. I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming back on to chat, Mark. It's always fun. Yeah, Jay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Now, if you want to take the next step, I publish a weekly newsletter and it's free. There's a link to subscribe right beneath this video. And you can join me and 50,000 other investors weekly for this exclusive content where I share my key action items and takeaways from conversations just like this and plenty others. Thanks for stopping by.